Hi, everyone. We're getting ready to start. Is everyone here for transference of dependencies regarding the bariatric surgeries? If so, you're in the right place. If not, it's one of the other symphony rooms, I do believe. My name's Frank Campbell. I'm here. I'm with uh, Pavilion in North Carolina, and I have the pleasure of introducing Al Rundio. I believe he has the most letters behind his name. There are at least 30, and he confessed that he left some off just for this. So we're in for a treat. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I was never good at sports, so education became my uh, like football team, you know? But anyway, um, just to give you a little bit about what we're doing today, I had to put these slides into this format. As you see, it's PCSSO, which is Training Providers Clinical Support System for Opioid Therapies. INSA is part um, of a grant. We got a grant last year. It's an extenuation grant with SAMHSA for, um, actually it's a $3 million grant, and then there's many, many different agencies that belong to that, and we are one of them. We are not getting $3 million, <laughs> a little piece of that. But um, what we do, we're trying to educate people on opioid addiction and opioid dependency and treatment. And some of that is interwoven into this lecture. And we have to do either four webinars or four live presentations a year. So last year we did uh, four presentations that were webinars. And then we thought with the conference there were many sessions that had opioid therapies in it that why not do some live sessions because they really wanted us to do some live sessions as well. So you will get a special evaluation that will go along with this, okay? Um, and um, you will complete that eval. And then um, we will get credit for the grant, but you also get contact hours for this as part of the conference, uh, which is offered by the California State Board of Nursing. So with that, I guess what started me kind of on this road was that, I don't know about you, but I believe in Florence Nightingale, right? And um, she did and learned through observation, that's what led her research, and it really came from patient observation. And what I was seeing, um, I practiced part-time in a residential addictions treatment center in South Jersey, and it was just from observation of patients that we were starting to see more people who had bariatric surgical procedures, and they were now dependent on other agents. So the goal then is of PCSSO is to offer evidence-based trainings on the safe and effective prescribing of opioid medications in the treatment of pain and or opioid addiction. And our focus is to reach providers and or providers in training from diverse healthcare professions including physicians, nursing, dentists, physician assistants, pharmacists, and program administrators. And it is very multidisciplinary. So my goals for you are that you could state the problem of obesity and substance use disorders, identify areas of the brain and the major neurotransmitters that have a role in obesity and substance use disorders, describe the three major types of bariatric surgical procedures, discuss how transference of food dependency to other substance use disorders results from bariatric surgical procedures, and gain a better understanding of a transferred dependency through a specific real case example. So I always introduce you to my kids. Now, if you were in, in my lecture yesterday, you can't respond to the question, but what kind of dog? These are, these are in all my slide sets. Got to break the monotony a little, right? So what kind of dog do you think? These guys know. Somebody said it in the back? I didn't hear it. Papillon. papillon. Okay, and papillon is French for butterfly. So the way their ears are pointy and the way they're colored, when you're behind them and they're walking from the back, they look like a monarch butterfly. What's an alpha male? Alpha male or alpha female. They rule the roost. I mean, I've had dogs before, but this is the first alpha dog. He rules me. He is, he is our drill sergeant. Let's introduce you to Luke. Luke's also a papillon, and he's in his first year of life there. Um, he has a medical condition. What do you think he's got? Luke has, if you see the running pen there, he has a condition called pica. 
He likes to ingest inanimate objects. First year of life, probably in about six months, he ingested three times. We have a wonderful facility in Philadelphia called the University of Pennsylvania Vet Hospital who saved his life three times. That hospital is staffed with all RNs, by the way, as the vet techs, and they all have a minimum of a bachelor's degree. They have critical care units. They are wonderful. Guess his health care cost. Hmm? No, no, not quite a million. We call them twenty thousand dollars, and he was an uninsured American back then. <laughs> Didn't access the insurance exchange, but here he is today. If you looked at the previous slide, he started to ingest the carpet, so he had to figure a way out. In this running pen, it's called Remnant Vinyl from Home Depot. Okay, he is now eight. We've kept him ingestion free for seven years, so he's in your arms in his crate in his pen. All right, well, that was just to break the monotony, but I truly am a dog lover, so <laughs> you can't tell that. So if we look at addiction, and just to give you some definitions, when we look at the American Society of Addictions Medicine, they say that it's a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry, and I do believe that it's a chronic illness, that the dysfunction in the circuits leads to characteristic biological, psychological, social, and spiritual manifestations. And it is reflected in an individual pathologically pursuing reward and relief by substance use and other behaviors. And when we look at it, it's usually the inability to consistently abstain. There can be impaired behavior control. There's cravings or increased hunger for drugs or rewarding experiences, and there's diminished recognition of significant problems with behavior at relationships, and some consider a dysfunctional emotional response. Now, I was very fortunate years back when I took the CARN AP to actually be able to sit on the ASEM certification review course. Nurses weren't allowed back then. But uh, my medical director, who was the president of the ACM chapter in New Jersey, got me to sit on that review. And one of the questions I had, and they had these wonderful physician presenters for two days. It was an excellent course. And one of the questions I had is food an addiction? And the response was, no, don't even go there. And now we're starting to see some differences, which is good. You know, so don't even go there. You can't justify you being overweight by saying you have a food addiction. But is food addiction? And that's one of the myths I think I want to go through because my belief is that it is, okay? So this is showing you body mass index table. And if you look at it, I'm not going to go through all the numbers, but if you look at the weight at the top and then down the left side, you'll see the height in inches. And then if you go across the bottom, Ideally, with your body mass index, you want to be like in the green or blue area. So, for example, if I'm six foot ten, I'll still be in the blue area at like 240, 250 pounds. But someone much shorter is going to have to weigh much, much less to lower their body mass index. That's what that's telling you. So, one way to combat, combat obesity is get taller, right? <laughs> Go on a stretching rack and get taller. Uh, <laughs> We know that obesity and overweight um, does have some effects on major organ systems in the body. Um, I'm not going to read every one, but certainly in the cardiovascular system, hypertension can be one, certainly heart failure, certainly more varicosities, um, certainly more prone to embolism. Respiratory system dyspnea, Pickwickian syndrome is a syndrome where um, it really affects the respiratory tract. And one of the presenting symptoms is sleep apnea, but it's felt because of the mass of weight you know, affecting the pulmonary system, it's going to create pulmonary hypertension would be another symptom along with that. One of the patients that I really had the opportunity to do some home health on um, probably about 10 years ago, one of, really one of my favorite patients, but... Um, we had a gentleman when I was at Shore Medical Center, I was the chief nursing officer there in Summers Point, and was a guy in our informatics department who asked me if I could do some home care um, on his dad, because his dad weighed over 500 pounds. He was maybe like five feet, five inches tall, short man, and he couldn't get out of the house. 
and he had diabetes, and he had prostate cancer, and he had, they couldn't even do uh, like prostate radiation on him because he couldn't fit on the table or anything. Um, so I said I, I would do that for him. I would do that for him. And he really was a great guy, but he was kind of confined to the bedroom and his bed. Like if he had to call the ambulance, they would have to like take out the windows to get him out into the rig. Well, I probably was there, you know, a couple years rendering primary care, and then he ran into respiratory problems, and actually what happened to him, he actually ended up stopping breathing because of the weight and, and the pressure on his pulmonary system. You know, he was trached, you know, he was on a vent, the whole nine yards, and that's what eventually um, killed him. So certainly, and we tried to work on small things, small increments to get him moving and all, but the guy had a problem most of his life, and... It was a very, very sad case, but that's what Pickwickian syndrome can do. Certainly, there can be neurological issues. Um, certainly, endocrine, especially when we look at diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Um, and then certainly, the psychological implications with low self-esteem, poor body image, depression. And certainly, impairing quality of life. So the first question then that I pose to you to get your thoughts can one be addicted to food? I agree. And I, I always said, you know, to me, um, I was always skinny as a kid. <laughs> That's because I think it was very active. And then it was really when I got into adulthood, I've been kind of like, kind of like a yo-yo person, you know, which isn't good for you. And um, one of my problems has been, but I've, you know, not would have been able trying to solve it, but I'm a binge eater. And I use food for reward or I use it when I'm upset. You know, it's not, you know how like some people, if they get upset, well, I don't eat. I'm the complete opposite. If I get upset or if I'm happy, I celebrate, you know. And I also had an Italian mother, so the whole culture centered around food. You know, that's how it is. If I go to my sister's house, who's worse than my mom ever was, it's like you're, she's feeding the army. And there's all these things of candy around it. You know, you just eat. That's part of the culture. So it's trying to combating that, and the way I control that lately, if she asks me to go come over, we say, come on, let's go, you know, why don't you come over for dinner, it's I reject the dinner offer, I'm too busy, because I know I'll overeat if I go there, so it's just trying to control things. And I always said that, I think it probably would be easier, maybe not, but when you look at drugs, for instance, like heroin or certain drugs, like I don't have to do that. But you do have to eat to maintain life, and that's the difference. And so I think part of it is, too, looking at our triggers and what causes us to eat. So I first want to cover a little bit about food dependency and food addiction, and then go into the bariatric procedures, and then go into the transference. And that's what I'm going to try to do here. Uh, the main foods that currently are viewed as addictive, certainly sugars, and I know for me that is a big thing, I've also found that I was substituting with things like Splenda, you know, and really some of those um, additives that are sugar substitutes are worse than sugar because they're really a lot more potent than sugar. So one of the things that I noticed and where I actually started to drop rate weight was um, when I have coffee now, I've learned to drink it with just cream in it. I like cream, but I don't put any sugar and I don't put any more Splenda in it. And I started to notice my weight go down when I stop that. Sometimes I, if I use that, it triggers me to eat more as well. Certainly starches. Um, I truly believe that carbohydrates are a big way that increase appetite. And I have found if you stick to, and I'm not saying it has to be a strict Atkins diet, but if you stick to more protein, protein is going to create, and your fats, like, like olive oil and different fats and fats from nuts and all, are going to t maintain a more steady state with your glucose th that you're not craving. Whereas if I start on carbs, and sometimes that's what I would do when I would binge at night, then I just keep going. You know, so I found the fewer carbs I eat, and I'm not saying I don't eat carbs, but the fewer I eat, the better. Some say fats, but I th find fats to be more satiating. Um, thank goodness I'm not a big salt person is I rarely ever add salt I don't like salt that much but salts certainly binge foods you know like if I get started on potato chips or I happen to like nacho cheese things or the little cheese twist things they kind of like drive me crazy and uh, 
you know, so if you look at them, they, they tend to be a lot of the addictive foods. Well, just like any dependency, it's the primitive hindbrain, it's that ventral segmental area, nucleus accumbens, amygdala, and the prefrontal cortex. And so part of the things, too, that I try to do with myself now a little is a little more cognitive thinking. Like, I'll be honest, today when I had, you know, when you had the continental breakfast, I happened to love cheese, and I love, like, cheese Danish, and they had little ones there. And I almost reached for it, and I said, nope, you're going to have some fruit and a cup of coffee. And that's what I had. Do you know what I mean? So it's just thinking about before you grab, and that's where the thought and judgment come in. So we also look at the primitive reward system, and that's how we survive, right? So the natural rewards are sex, safety, companionship, and of course food is part of that, right? We have to eat to stay alive. And there are certainly neurotransmitters in that reward pathway, serotonin, dopamine, and of course your endorphins. And we know from studying rats and mice that if we put them on sugar-based diets or sugar-based fluid, they will keep going back for it. Okay, so we've learned from animals that this is what happens. So drugs kind of hijack the reward system, and then the traditional rewards become secondary. Um, and some of them may not be as intense or concentrated as drugs, and of course food can be one of them. And certainly, we know that there are many, many reward pathways that create addiction. And certainly, it involves, you know, you're sending neuron and you're receiving neuron. It involves dopamine release, that's the pleasure neurotransmitter, as well as controlling other things in the body, like our blood pressure, right? And then there um, certainly are other serotonin receptors, there's the endogenous opioid system, all that contribute to pleasure. Now if you look at the bottom slide, if you look what cocaine does, it blocks that reuptake pump, right? I said yesterday our body is always trying to maintain homeostasis, so when we put out a neurochemical, there's the uptake pump that's going to take some back to that sending neuron in an attempt to like equalize things. And of course, one of the theories is it may, too, may take too much back of that neurotransmitter where there's not enough circulating. And then we substitute it with something if we deplete our dopamine levels, for instance, something else to, to give us that kind of high. And of course, that could be food, and some people's it's drugs. So notice which foods enhance reward. And what they've been able to study, for example, with serotonin, it's things like warm milk. Now, I don't know about you, that's not a problem for me. I never liked warm milk. Chocolate milk warm is fine. <laughs> right? Pasta, well, being Italian, that's fine too. Uh, potatoes, bananas, and turkey. One of my favorite dinners of all, the whole year is Thanksgiving. And look at all the carbs and what you ingest, and I don't know what your table's like, right? But it's potatoes, it's candied sweet potatoes, it's stuffing, it's the turkey, it's all these kind of like what I call pleasure comfort foods. Dopamine would be your sugar and your white starches. And there are people, and one of the things that I am trying to do is eat less of your white processed starches, like me eating more whole grain bread as opposed to like white bread. And then the opiates, chocolate. One of my favorite foods, but not the most favorite, but with candy, it's got to be chocolate-covered nuts or chocolate and peanut butter together. Uh, hard candy, sugar candy, does nothing for me. Uh, certainly sugar. Um, certainly your dairy products and some spices. So, okay, we all agree... I'm hearing in the room we agree that food can be an addiction, and, and I agree with you, and I, I think that is what the research is demonstrating to us. So then how do we treat it? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. Look at the amount of dollars that we spend on trying to treat obesity with pills, be that prescription medication or over-the-counter medication. Now, I've 
personally have tried about every type of owner over the counter medication that you can buy. And I'll be honest, when I really assess it, it does nothing to control my appetite. I don't know about you, I don't know if some of you have tried it or if I'm alone, but it does nothing. Um, today, I really don't recommend that people take stimulant drugs like amphetamines to control your appetite. And the reality is, it will, it will control it. I mean, I remember years ago, like our physician would prescribe fasting, was one of the amphetamines, and it will control your appetite, and it will keep you up, and you'll have energy, and you'll lose weight, but what happens the minute when you stop the drug? You put it back on, right, because it's not, you can't do that all the time. So some of these drugs, when we look at the sympathomimetics, like menteramine, didrex, those types of meds, they really are in the amphetamine class to speed up, and of course, they're considered an anorexic because when you're taking them, you eat less. Okay. Orlistat, I, I've never tried and I would not, your lipase inhibitor, <laughs> because uh, the way this process with blocking things and, and all, you really get like liquid diarrhea that can come on at any time. Um, and then Belvique, that was felt to be a very promising drug because it actually hits the serotonin 2C receptor sites. And it's felt that you'll decrease hunger. But then I was reading something on the internet where when they looked at sample populations where they've trialed the drug and all, people would only, the most they lost was about 5% of their body weight. And then when they, the following year, they gained about 25% back. So they're not really sure that this drug is really that effective. Although when it first came out, it was felt to be like the wonder drug for weight loss. And then you can combine agents. Like with Topamax, generally most people lose weight in antidepressant and you're combining it with amphetamine. Don't forget some of these drugs, especially the ones that speed you up, will cause hypertension, have an effect on the cardiovascular system, and sometimes also can affect your heart valves as well. So again, if we sum it up with standard treatments, looking at your appetite suppressants like dexedrine, you can use hormone-based drugs like leptin. Your fat absorption drugs is the Orlistat, which is available over the counter now. Um, you can try high-dose antidepressants or your mood stabilizers. Um, and even the thought of trying naltrexone. We know that naltrexone, which has been tried in some patients, will, um, will actually you know, hit some of the other receptors. For example, we know it works on alcoholism because it blocks some of the uh, alcohol receptors and thought to be some like of your endogenous endorphins as well. Zoloft combining Zoloft and Revia together. Okay, great. So with the fact that sometimes these therapies don't work or they're not long term, you know, bariatric surgery may be indicated. And, and I want to uh, stand here and say I am very pro-bariatric procedures, especially for morbidly obese people, because if you can stop diabetes and some of the other consequences, I mean, I, I think it is a very therapeutic procedure. So I'm going to cover the three types of procedures you see. Basically what happens with your bariatric surgical procedures, you'll inhibit absorption of food, such as the gastric bypass, you can obstruct food intake, and that's with your lap band, and then you can limit the amount of food intake secondary to the gastric size, and that is the gastric sleeve, which is one of the newer procedures out, and that seems to be the most popular today. Once upon a time, it was the bypass, but I think you're seeing more gastric sleeve procedures being accomplished today. Well, you can see that really with any of the procedures. We're going to go over this. You're absolutely right. And you'll see they're not like 100% effective. You'll see that. Mm -hmm. It's a great question, and you will absolutely see that. So let's go over um, some of the general requirements. Is you're supposed to have a BMI above 40 or 35 with hypertension. And, and I have seen some people, we had one worker where I practiced at who had a bariatric procedure, and I don't believe she met the classification. You know, but, and, but again, it's for the morbidly obese. Certainly if they have like hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, severe sleep apnea, 
documentation that other attempts at weight loss have been ineffective, highly motivated um, to increase activity and establish healthier eating habits, smoke-free for at least six months, and able to tolerate general anesthesia. Now, why would insurance companies exclude you? And a lot of people initially are rejected. And, and what I do tell people, because I have a colleague of mine who's a nurse who had the lap band done, and initially the insurance company rejected her, and I encourage people, then you appeal it. You know, you got to appeal to the insurance company. So if they have um, alcohol or drug abuse issues, if they have active liver disease, if they have an untreated psychiatric condition, uh, most insurance companies require psychiatric consultation today before you have the procedure. If they have um, a correctable cause of the obesity, let's say they're hypothyroid and that's felt to be causing the obesity. Uh, if they're unable to comply with the program guidelines, if they are have unstable eating patterns related to medications or an uncontrolled eating disorder. So these are the three major types of procedures, what's called the ruin wide bi gastric bypass, your adjustable gastric band or your lap band, and what's called a vertical sleeve gastrectomy. And I'm also going to comment a little bit when we get to the vertical sleeve as well. So in the ruined bypass, the stomach then gets divided into a proximal small gastric pouch and a disconnected um, larger pouch. And you can see the small pouch there called the proximal pouch of the stomach coming off the esophagus. Um, and so then what you're doing, you're bypassing through what's called the rue limb, you're bypassing because you then connect into the jejun, so you do a gastrojejunostomy, and you're bypassing the largest portion of the stomach. Now, the theory behind it is that the large pouch then is removed from the food transporting process, but it still continues to secrete gastric acid, pepsin, intrinsic factor into the duodenum. The gastric and pancreatic and biliary secretions travel down the duodenum, eventually mix with the food at the point where this limb and the rue limb are surgically connected into a common channel. So the theory is, by creating this small pouch, or kind of like what I call a new stomach, you know, you're going to eat less. And that's true for most patients when it's first done, but after time you can stretch the pouch, okay? Now, what are some of the most common, it is one of the most common weight loss procedures in the country, but I think it's really being exceeded now by the gastric sleeve. Um, it's probably superior to purely restrictive procedures like the lap band, and you'll see why in a few minutes, especially for long-term weight loss. Uh, the procedure interferes with the pulsatile secretion of ghrelin. Ghrelin is a peptide hormone that stimulates your appetite. So thereby, it should contribute to decreased appetite, which is great. The gastrojejunosophy component is associated with dumping syndrome. So that's characterized by lightheadedness, nausea, diaphoresis, abdominal pain, flatulence, and diarrhea, especially if the patient eats a high sugar meal. Uh, that also can contribute, though, to increased weight loss by negatively conditioning patients against eating high sugar meals, because then you're not eating a lot of high sugar meals, you should lose more weight. And then it depends how that rule limb is connected and where, you know, because the greater the degree of malabsorption can occur if the channel is shorter, thus it would be less exposure time to digesting with all the enzymes and all the other factors that are involved. So you do see some patients then who do sometimes um, have some issues with like electrolytes and other types of things that go on in the body. Some of the complications, you can have leaks where they ask to most the, um, the limb. You certainly can have strictures and ulcers. There can be nutritional deficiencies. There can also be small bowel obstruction that results from adhesions or hernia. And also some patients develop gallstones and a gastritis. And then you can see the mean excess weight loss is about 62% after one year and maintaining weight loss about 55% long term. Okay. The lap band. <clears throat> this is a tight adjustable silicon band that gets placed around the upper portion of the stomach. 
Um, and then the band gets attached to an infusion port that's placed in the sub-Q tissue. And then you restrict the flow of food by increasing the amount of saline you inject to the port, which tightens the band. Um, and it results in a uh, reduction in the diameter of the band, and so you'll eat less. Okay. Now, some of the um, problems with this, the mean excess weight is lower when we compare it to the bypass surgery. Efficacy is based solely on early fullness of the patient due to a smaller capacity of the stomach because you have the band constricting it. Advantage includes lower mortality rate of all the bariatric surgical procedures, less than 0.5%. Um, you can remove it. You can have the band removed if there's a problem. There's no incisions into the stomach, no large incisions into the stomach. Quicker recovery time, adjustability without reoperation, lack of malabsorption issues because you're really not bypassing anything. You're just restricting the amount of food in the gut. And uh, pregnant women can accommodate need for increased caloric intake simply by loosening the band. You know, you can eat more if you loosen the band. Now, the disadvantage is there can be a fairly high complication rate. One can be erosion of the band into the stomach. And I actually know a person who recently had that, had to be hospitalized and had to have it surgically removed. Um, there can be frequent esophageal dysmotility. And there's certainly frequent long-term follow-up for band and band adjustments. Um, also, what can happen from the band tightening, patients, some develop portal hypotension, and some also develop GERD. And um, so what happened to my colleague who had a gastric band, her sister at age 45 had died of diabetes. And she had really bad diabetes, and then she had really needed a cardiac transplant, but a transplant never came in time, and I don't know if they would have really transplanted her with the bad diabetes she had. So she died at 45. So what my friend started to notice in her 50s was that her weight was going up, and then her blood sugar started to go up, where she was running like average blood sugars of around 150. And she decided that, you know, it's time to do something. So she had tried exercise, she had tried dieting on her own, nothing was working. She tried over-the-counter weight loss meds, so she decided to have the lap band done. She had the lap band done, and she probably had it about five years or so, and was doing very well. She had lost a significant amount of weight, she had gotten thin, her blood sugar was normal, she was doing well. Then she started with GERD symptoms, <laughs> And when she was scoped, because this person happens to have been a person, she did practice in addictions with me, but her big specialty, and she had worked for a GI practice. So she was really one into scoping procedures. You know? So she was scoped with an upper endoscopy. And anyway, what um, happened was she had Barrett's esophagus. So when she discussed it with the physician, he said, I really think it's time for the band to go. That's what's causing the root of this, is changing all these cellular changes in your esophagus. So she had the band removed. Now, I just saw her this past weekend, and guess where she is now? Weight's back up. I didn't ask her where her blood sugar was, but, you know, she's back to where she was because the band's been removed. You can see the mean excess weight loss here is about 40% after one year and about 43% long term. This is the procedure that I'm seeing done most frequently today. It's called the vertical sleeve gastrectomy, what we call the gastric sleeve. And the majority of the stomach really is removed, leaving a thin tubular stomach with the pylorus intact. So you're not bypassing anything, you're just taking out most of the stomach. And you can see what you're left with is kind of like a banana-shaped stomach. Okay. Now, what was done prior to this, I ran into someone last week who, several years back, and she's kept all her weight off, she had a stapling procedure done. If you remember, they were stapling much like that, putting staples in rather than removing the stomach. Today, it's really the idea of removing that piece of the stomach. So it initially was offered to severely obese patients, generally if patients had a BMI greater than 60, as a bridge to the more uh, technically challenging gastric bypass procedure 
but now it is used as a single procedure and it is the one that I see used most frequently. Where I practice at, we have a couple nurses, one nurse and her son has had the gastric sleeve done. Uh, we have a friend of our family who is very morbidly obese. She had the gastric sleeve done. Uh, we've had members of our family had the gastric sleeve done. So the efficacy is really due to the small tubular stomach and it's resistant to stretch due to the absence of the fundus, alterations in gastric motility, and a substantial reduction in ghrelin producing cells. So that again, you should theoretically eat less. The advantages, decreased hormonal ghrelin stimulation for hunger, minimization of the dumping syndrome because the pylorus is preserved and you're not bypassing anything, minimal malabsorption, um, appropriate in patients who are too high risk for gastric bypass and certainly greater efficacy than banding with greater safety than bypass. The disadvantages, you can develop a leak. It's irreversible. I mean, when, once that part of your stomach is gone, it's gone, right? Uh, some insurance companies may consider it investigational. Um, the mean excess weight loss, about 55% after one year and about 50% long term. So more similar to your gastric bypass. One of the major complications you will have with this, again, is GERD. Because you've cut out a good portion of the stomach, there's less stomach there and a lot of people get reflux. Now, so if we summarize it, if we look at the drugs, um, and then you'll see what the complications are, you know, and certainly with fenteramine it can be dependence, hypertension, pulmonary hypertension, Orlistat kind of told you was the oily, fecally spotting, the flatulence. Um, Locasarin, that's your Belvic, is your headache. Uh, Fentiramine and topiramate can be abuse potential, insomnia, anxiety, and some patients get suicidal. The gastric bypass, it's your dumping syndrome. Anastomotic leaks and nutritional deficiencies. The gastric band, vomiting, reflux, band slippage, or band erosion, which would be one of the more dangerous things. And the sleeve can be vomiting, reflux, and diarrhea. The other thing that we can look at is residential and community-based treatment, trying to get people to do moderate food intake and trying to get them to eat a well-balanced diet and to exercise. So if we look at it, would we treat eating disorders differently if we really viewed them as an addiction. So hunger releases the hormone ghrelin from the stomach which activates dopamine and that creates cravings. And certainly what about food cues? Things like smells, sights, tastes also can increase cravings. Um, some studies have demonstrated that overweight people have a diminished dopamine response. Thus they would have more cravings. And sugar also plays a role in releasing endorphins. Fats have also been implicated. However, most of the literature that I read, and I know with my own self, if the fats are good, sometimes along with protein, they are much more satiating. Um, and certainly, food generally relieves pain and gives us a sense of well-being. What was interesting, in some studies, when they looked at rats after sugar binging, rats would actually show signs of opiate withdrawal, especially if they were given naltrexone because you're blocking those opioid sites. What about satiation? The stomach also gives feedback to stop eating. A full stomach releases the hormone leptin, which leads to appetite satiation. So is dieting a gateway to drugs? You know, and fasting is really not good for you from the standpoint you slow your metabolism, right? All the literature also set today says to eat small, frequent meals, maybe like six meals a day, so that you have that metabolic burn as opposed to like fasting where you slow metabolism. Your body then starts to try to conserve the fat so everything slows down and you actually sometimes gain weight. And dieting can increase the rewarding effects of most drugs. And alcohol and food we know enhances endorphins, dopamine, and serotonin, so it makes us feel better. And a cross sensitization will occur also with your amphetamines and sugar. So if we summarize food addiction, it's a neurochemical excess of serotonin, dopamine, and your endorphins. It heightens rewards in the limbic brain, the primitive hind brain. 
Uh, trigger foods will stimulate excess neurochemicals. Also, this will become exaggerated when starving or overeating or purging. And a binge of neurochemicals will override the normal checks and balances, which can foster addictive eating behaviors and a gateway to substance use. So then the next question I raise, can a person become addicted to substances after having a bariatric surgical procedure? Sure. And this is what I observed. And I just started to note that all of a sudden, we're getting more patients who had bariatric surgical procedures, and they're addicted to something. So we have one of the authors in the room here, Suzanne Fogger. I, pulled her literature, um, she authored an article uh, with McGinnis, The Relationship Between Addictions and Bariatric Surgery for Nurses in Recovery. And this was a sub-analysis of a cross-section of 173 impaired nurses in a state monitoring program. And 14%, or 25 of these nurses, had a bariatric surgical procedure. 17 of these 25 nurses developed a substance use disorder following the procedure. I also had spoken to Suzanne Kinkle, one of our members, and she was working in New Jersey in the RAMP program, and she pulled data for me and similar, similar results from the data in New Jersey. People in the RAMP program, a certain, when she looked at the people that had bariatric surgical procedures, these numbers were very, very similar. So let me give you my little case study, which is what really started me sort of on this um, journey here. And let's call her Jane. And this probably happened about six, eight months ago. But Jane was a healthcare professional for a number of years. She actually worked in the field of radiation oncology. And she had worked at uh, one of the local hospitals where I live and, and where I practice at. And she had come in, and 10 years prior, she had had a uh, bariatric gastric bypass procedure, because they weren't doing the sleeve that much then. And I remember when I did her um, h &P, you know, she was very thin. She had maintained her weight. You, she was not a heavy person. She, I don't believe she put any weight on from the procedure. She really implicitly took care of her weight. But as I'm going through her h &P, I noticed that, um, you know, she had this gastric bypass procedure, and she was there admitted for alcoholism. So one of the things that I always do with my patients, and I'm sure probably all of you do, I always like to know what got them started on drugs. You know, did it start in adolescence? Um, what triggered it? What, why are they doing this? And she was a very intelligent woman to talk to. I thoroughly enjoyed talking to her, and she was a great professional. And she said to me that, I think I put it there, she related that she had not become an alcoholic until after the bariatric procedure, that alcohol was not something that she really preferred through most of her life. And I said, well, what triggered it then? Why are you drinking? Are you depressed? Are you in a bad relationship? What's doing it? She said, no, she said, come on now. It's just a transfer of one addiction to that of drinking or using another substance and mine was alcohol. She said, I was a food addict. I needed a bariatric surgical procedure. I could never control my weight. So what have I done? I've just transferred the dependency from food to alcohol. And alcohol is one of the things that you see a lot because think about it, especially with a bypass, they will absorb it more quickly and usually in smaller amounts. So it's, it, it's much quicker that they become dependent. So to me then, I start thinking, you know, and again, this is where one of my favorite people is Florence Nightingale because she was so simplistic yet so futuristic and so bright that if you look at her theories like why she had light in her theory, well, patients who were sick always turned their head to light. It was all from observation. And so this is what Jane did for me, is that I started thinking, you know, hmm, there's something to these bariatric surgical procedures. Because the two most frequently things that I see that they're dependent on, one is alcohol, the other is opiates. That's what I see most frequently.
Right, right. Transfers to something else, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and usually all patients do go through a psychiatric evaluation, you know, as well. And they, they don't touch on that. Yeah, it's interesting. And that's probably because, I guess, dependent upon who they use, maybe the psychiatrists that they use don't have um, experience in the field of addictions, you know, to go there and are, are used to treating other psychiatric disorders. Yeah, right. The way. Wow. Wow, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. She said that she heard that the people will develop cirrhosis more quickly, that one year is like 10 years in another person because of the absorption rate of the alcohol in the smaller amounts. Yeah. So, I mean, the other thing that I see are opiates. Now, I believe the opiates come from people on pain meds post-op, and of course you know with the opiates that certainly it doesn't take much before certain people can become dependent. So, so we would see, you know, I see probably half or more with alcohol, the other half with opioid dependency. So, I, and I don't know about you, I don't know if you're seeing anything else, but um, that's something that we definitely see in the treatment center where, where I'm at are those two things, um, the opiates and the alcohol. Uh, occasionally you'll have some patients also doing benzos. So some questions and points that I think we need to ponder. A lot of these patients have issues of self-esteem, there's no question. I mean a lot of thin people have issues of self-esteem. I mean I think sometimes it's self-esteem. Um, there's two major types of pain, right? Physical, but what about psychological pain, you know? Does the psychological pain, especially things like low self-esteem, leave one after they become thin following a bariatric procedure? You know, I'll be very honest, but a person who's a very good friend of my sister, it's actually my godparent's daughter, has been morbidly obese her, her whole life. I, I mean, again, has to be over 400 to 500 pounds. And I would always talk to my sister, and I would say, I don't understand why she's not doing something. And then finally this year, probably about six, eight months ago, she called my sister and said that she was going to have the gastric sleeve done. And I really applauded her because I thought this is excellent. What was really interesting, um, her husband, and I mean, they dated the whole time she was very obese and, and they're married and all, he didn't want her to have the procedure done. So of course, one of the questions when my sister and I were talking about it was, does he not want her to have the procedure done because maybe he's afraid that if she gets too thin, she's a very attractive woman, she's just heavy, you know, that maybe then, because he's older than her, that maybe someone else will swoop her up or, or whatnot. Because again, just for her health status, you would want her to have the procedure. So again, does sometimes actually getting thin, could that have an adverse outcome? I mean, you don't think about that, but that could be something that maybe destroys her marriage. And then maybe that would lead her to alcoholism or something. Um, and then is the transference to another substance more a result of continued psychological pain versus the brain biology and addiction? Something to think about. And I think there's no doubt that the research is minimal in this field. 
Um, I applaud people like Suzanne Fogger for doing a study on that, and we definitely need more research looking at all the dependencies related to this and, and to see, you know, to be aware of it when we're in treatment centers. So, comments, questions? Okay, forward. That one. No, I think that's great food for thought. My, my only thing, I look at addiction more as like a four-pronged model, biological, psychological, sociological, and spiritual. So I think a lot of times there's an intersection. I believe in the biological model, but I think it's more than that. Pre-op, right? Her comment was, and I'm just going to repeat it because we're being taped for the grant, but it would be interesting to see if there was any literature out there on education of the patient pre-op to see if that helps. And that'd be, it's a great role for nursing and screening, yes. Yep, absolutely. Stomach, okay, great. She said it was based in rat models where they gave IV alcohol to rats. They feel there may be something with the, the neurotransmitters in the gut as contributing to it. Okay. Yeah, what she was saying was that she has done these psychiatric evaluations pre-op, 
And she said the person is to the stage where they, they just want the surgery done because of the health consequences. And so she said then you go through it in the rope procedure because you want to get them the surgery because they, they want it because of the health consequences. And I believe that's what happened with the friend of my sister. At least that's what I was told. She recognized that you know she's now like in her 40s and that if she doesn't do something with this weight, she's probably going to die. And it was the health consequences that led her she wanted to get healthier before something happened. And that's when she realized she needed to lose the weight. Great. Let me uh, couch what she said and tell me if I've got it right, but she's saying she feels the medical providers, because um, she works as a psych MP in a medical practice, drop the ball because they, they just look at obesity and in food eating as just like something you like to do, kind of like as we once upon a time thought about addictions, and they don't really address any of the addiction issues or delve into it, and if they maybe started to do that, outcomes would be better. Yeah. Good points. Anything else? Okay. Anybody else? There was one in the back. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that comment about um, the woman who was going to have surgery and her husband was kind of not supportive of that. Right. I was thinking about how in substance use disorder we talk about the role of different dynamics at play and the woman being an enabler and either consciously or subconsciously the addicted person staying in addiction to serve as a positive benefit for them and that's very similar to the case that you just described. Yeah. yeah, good point. She found it interesting where the husband wasn't supportive, and right, we always talk about family and family being enablers and that type of thing, and here you kind of have the opposite, where he didn't want her to have the surgery. Right. 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 Yeah, he said that he had uh, a patient, a client, who, when his wife got thin, she was no longer attractive because her being fat is what was the attraction to him. That's what he found, I guess, to be sexy or whatnot, you know, and it was very simple. That's what was missing, so. Well, um, I leave you with my contact info. By the way, if you see any articles or come across anything, um, I'm like embarking on this. It's one of my passions right now, my new passion. So please email me or call me um, because I think there's a lot to be done in this field. And, and again, we're seeing more and more patients like this. So we always like to try to help the clients. And the more we learn about it, I think the better. And thank you for your participation. Now, make sure you check that you are at this session and probably you will get two evaluations sent to you. One will be a little long, but it is for the PCSSO grant, and we need that feedback um, so that we can continue to receive this grant for the next two years. Thank you very much. Thank you.